So if you remember the first three weeks of our sermon series, we've been focusing on the first chapter of Luke. Luke, as you know, was a physician and he made a detailed account because he wanted us to know all the details that we could before he got around to talking about Jesus. So he elaborated and um, this chapter is the longest chapter in the New Testament, it's 80 verses. <laughs> and Luke wanted us to know that these details that God showed him were important so that we would have the background knowledge before we accepted Christ. He wanted us to know about John the Baptist who came to prepare the way for Jesus. So he explained through 80 verses before he got around to Jesus. He wanted us to study And now we have been delving into his chapter. You know, we've studied about who we are. We've learned not to let society dictate or define who we are. To allow God to define who you are and tell you who you are. So that you know, without a doubt, who you are. Secondly, we looked at how we can say yes to God. Even when God presents a major transformation. Think about it, Elizabeth. I'm using the same name sign for Elizabeth as yours, Elizabeth Radcliffe. So I'm honoring you with this. Remember, Elizabeth was elderly and conceived. She was pregnant and had a baby. Mary was a teenager. She was a virgin. And Luke went into great detail, 80 verses about these two women who both said yes to God's biggest challenge for them. The third week hash, was hashtag blessed. And we talked about how that word is misused in our society. You know, oh, I got to park really close to the store. Hashtag blessed. I got a free coffee at Starbucks. Hashtag blessed. But hash, but blessedness has such a deeper meaning. Mary was blessed. She bore the savior of the world. Elizabeth was blessed. She conceived in her old age and she for John the Baptist. You know, we also were talking about curses because Christians tend to say, oh, don't talk badly. Don't say the B word or the D word or the S word. They feel insulted when they see that language. But you know what curses also means? Things that we say that tear down other people, that insult people, that hurt people's feeling, like saying, well, you can't come to church because your life is in disarray. You have a wrong lifestyle. You're in sin, so you are not allowed to come in here. That is cursing as well as any of the, quote, curse words. And in today's chapter, we're still going into Luke. Luke is not done talking about Mary and Elizabeth. Luke wants you and I to be comfortable Discussing women. I know some people are still uncomfortable talking about women. And in the Bible, we do tend to focus on the men and the women aren't mentioned a whole lot. But in Luke, Luke has written 80 verses focusing on two women. And I want us to be comfortable talking about types of people that we tend to avoid, whether it's women whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's people of other races. 
you know, read the Holy Bible. Everything is here from A to Z. And we can't just say that we're going to talk about this and not focus on that. Remember, I preached before about the whole and the gospel. Some churches tend to like cut out parts of the gospel. And so there's a big hole there and say, well, we're not going to approach this and we're not going to talk about this. We'll talk about all this other stuff in these verses down below. But no, the complete word is from God and we need to learn and parse out all of it, including the first chapter of Luke. I want you to be comfortable learning how to discuss these two women, okay? And I want you to remember the words in this scripture, okay? This is Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 63. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they planned to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother, Elizabeth, spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Now the friends and relatives said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they gestured to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. Zechariah asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. So remember that. They were all astonished and amazed. You know, there's a lot of amazing things in this world, right? There's a lot of different types of animals and insects and birds that God has created. So many different ones. It's astonishing. Scientists, in fact, are still discovering new types of species. Even in the year 2020, scientists are discover they've discovered 40, over 40 new types of animals, birds, and insects. Can you imagine it? That is truly astounding. In Iran, they found what's no termed a velvet spider. This velvet spider has thick um, hairs on it, and it was just discovered in 2020. And also in the Amazon, they found a new type of wasp. It's, it's a, called a parasite because it will fly, land on the back of a spider, lay its eggs on the spider's back. So the wasp convinced the spider somehow chemically to make a web that covers the egg from the wasp. And so the spider makes a web to protect the egg until it hatches and can emerge and fly away. That is truly astounding. And what about snowflakes? No, please, no. I want snow. We're not going to have a white Christmas this year. But at snowflakes. Can you imagine 
all the snowflakes coming from the sky, there are no two that have the same pattern at all. And how does that happen? I mean, only God knows that. Wow. There are no two that are alike. Every flake of snow has a different configuration. And that is so amazing. And here's my favorite example, identical twins. So I've got a couple of sisters who are identical twins. Now identical twins, twins come from one fertilized egg. Some split on the second day, some split on the fourth day, others split on the sixth day. And then they attach to the womb and then the babies develop separately. Isn't that cool? And that comes from one egg. And even though each of the, each of the parts of the egg have the exact same DNA, the children's fingerprints are totally different. And we don't know how that works. That's really astonishing because it's been one egg, it's attached to the same womb, it develops the same way, they look alike, but their fingerprints are totally different. And that's amazing. Now my two sisters, when they were newborn, we used to get them mixed up. You know, we, when my mom and I took them to the, to the uh, hospital, we had to take them two times to get their footprint so that we knew who, which one was which. And then we would give them different colored socks. One would wear pink and one would wear blue. But when we bathed them, we would get them mixed up and we had to take them back to the hospital to check their footprints. So we always tease them and said, well, maybe you guys are going to marry the wrong guy. You never know. <laughs> maybe you're going to swap husbands unintentionally. But it's just kind of cool that identical twins coming from one egg still have unique fingerprints. That's astounding. And, you know, land tortoises can live to be 200 years old. My son Elijah uh, bought a baby tortoise. And he said, hey, I have to take somebody find somebody to take care of this after I die. So he's gonna pass it on for 200 years. The tur tortoise is gonna outlive him. And that's astounding. But this story does have something that's not amazing. Zachariah said that his son will be named John. But Elizabeth already knew that. She'd already told them that her baby was gonna be named John, but the friends and the relatives just blew her off and asked Zachariah, what's the baby's name? Did you notice that when I was reading the verses? Let me go into this a little more. Remember the details that Luke includes. He was a very wise man. He was very learned and he was very detail oriented and he includes these details for reasons. Now, Zechariah worked, he was a priest. He worked in the temple. He and Elizabeth were devout. They were both elderly. They both had no children. And then one day while um, Zechariah was serving in the temple, the angel of the Lord appeared and said, you will have a son and you shall name him John. And the name John means God is gracious. And Zechariah said, what? That's impossible. I'm old. And the result of that was the angel said, well, you're going to be silenced until your baby's born. You're not gonna be able to talk. So he was mute until John was born. So Zachariah was silenced. 
He was mute. He was unable to speak for eight months. And the baby grew in Elizabeth's womb. Now you have to remember the angel did not visit Elizabeth, but Elizabeth knew automatically that for this to happen, she said, the Lord has looked with pleasure on me. And God has removed my disgrace. Elizabeth knew intuitively that her pregnancy happened from God. And she knew that God had a unique purpose for her child. And Elizabeth, that was a miracle for Elizabeth to be pregnant at that age. And she knew that her child would be born for a unique purpose. When we read Elizabeth's response, Luke wants us to know that in her society, she had been ostracized and marginalized because she had no children. And the birth of a baby really redeemed her personally. And at the same time, John came to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, our true redeemer. So anyway, that day when it happened, Elizabeth went into labor. In verse 58, it says, the neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had blessed Elizabeth and they rejoiced with her. And I was really happy to, to read that part. However, these very same friends and family just a week later came again. And in verse 59, it says, the people decided that the baby would be named Zechariah after his father. So there. You know, back in Bible times, a firstborn son most typically was named after the father. And that's how they would uh, just carry on their lineage. And that's where we get the practice of naming kids after their dads and calling them junior. And also during that time, the fathers used to be the ones to name the baby. In Matthew, Joseph is the one who said his name will be Jesus. But in Luke, it's very different. If you remember, the angel told Mary that you will bear a child and you will name him Jesus. Joseph wasn't even there in Luke's rendition. So the versions are very different. Now, you remember, Zechariah was unable to speak for nine months. And you have to remember, as the people came together to see Elizabeth, who had just gone through labor, she wasn't in a hospital. She didn't have an epidural or anything. She had suffered through the whole birth process and her neighbors and friends decided to name the baby instead of asking her. They decided to name the child Zechariah instead of having Elizabeth, instead of asking Elizabeth. But Luke writes, Elizabeth spoke up and said, no, my baby's name is John. So Elizabeth knew she knew the baby was to be named John. And I think we can trust Elizabeth's word, right? I mean, after all, she is the mother. She was the one who was pregnant for nine months. She was the miracle. I mean, she was old and she conceived. So she was a miracle and her baby was a miracle. And her child was set aside for a unique purpose. But her friends and her relatives gathered around and totally discounted what she had to say. 
they said, huh, you don't have anybody named John in your family. Go aside with you. Let's ask Zechariah. So they gestured to Zechariah. What are you going to name the baby? Zechariah took a tablet and a writing utensil and wrote, his name is John. And it said that the people were amazed. No doubt Elizabeth was like rolling her eyes and saying, I just told them his name was John. But everybody had to wait until they could get it from Zechariah instead of paying attention to what the mother had actually told them. I think Luke wanted us to take note of that. It also says that the people could see God's work because Elizabeth's conception was a miracle that had never happened before. Both the parents were very old and still she was pregnant and the folks around could not see the big picture. They couldn't see what it was that God was trying to tell us. They didn't understand that this baby would grow to be John the Baptist who would help people prepare their hearts, help people repent, to open their hearts so that they would be able to welcome Jesus during Jesus' time. This story is evidence that Christ needs, folk, needs us to repent, to clean up our acts, to clean up our hearts before we can welcome him fully into our lives. And if we hadn't known about these two women, if we hadn't known about the different groups of folks, how could we learn about Jesus? Really, if we resist these stories, and the experiences of these people in the Bible, it means that we are not prepared to bring Christ into our hearts completely. We will just bring him in in part, but not let him take residence completely in our hearts. We have to clean and learn to love all of God's children. Wouldn't you agree? So Elizabeth tried to speak up, but they discounted her. They didn't even give the mother a chance to talk. So now this fourth sermon again is about the two women, Mary and Elizabeth. Mary was a young virgin and Elizabeth was an elderly lady, but God decided that these two would play a major role in the nativity story. You can see my nativity right back here. Let's see if we can uh, highlight it. Here it is. You know, and before this happened, there was Mary and Elizabeth. They were highlighted in chapter one and Jesus's birth happened in chapter two. So Luke wanted us to know in a very detailed manner what led to the birth of Jesus. And before we're ready to cleanse our hearts and offer Jesus in, we have to stay silent just as Zachariah was silent. We need quiet as well. We need to listen to what people have to say to us. Someone said, oh, you know, I hate that song, Mary, Did You Know? You know, my oldest son, Elijah, he sang that so many years ago while he was a teenager. He used to sing it in church and he loved that song. And after my sermon, Lori is going to sing this for us. 
he was supposed to, she was supposed to sing it before my sermon, but I went ahead and uh, jumped ahead. So Lori will sing it afterwards. She'll be singing us the song, Mary, Did You Know? And it's a beautiful song. That song says, Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. It's just a beautiful song. So the person, I don't know who it was, told my friend, well, of course Mary knew because the verses said that the angel Gabriel had already told her that she was going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then the friend said, I bet a man wrote this song. So anyway, I went ahead and Googled that. And it's kind of funny. When I Googled, I found out, yep, two guys did write that song. <laughs> So I want all of you to be comfortable talking about, listening and about, learning about everything that's in this holy book. You know, our habit of picking and choosing needs to stop. We need to develop a new habit of reading it in entirety. You know, sometimes women are uncomfortable speaking of equality. Sometimes that makes people nervous. And sometimes we'll, people will say, well, today everything's better. But you know what? I'm sorry to say I cannot agree with that statement. Worldwide, people still have problems listening to the voices and the opinions of everyone. Today, there are so many women who are called to speak but people resist listening to what they have to say. I like statistics, you know I love statistics. I was reading in a business magazine and it said that women learn how to say that if they do something worthy of accomplishment, they say, we did this and that, instead of saying, I did this. And I do that myself as well. I say, well, we, instead of I. If I do a project, I'll say, well, we did this project. Because if a woman says, I did this, people tend to look at her and say, well, you're pretty egotistical, aren't you? Right? And the same statistician researched and said that men use the pronoun I with no blame or no repercussions at all. So Elizabeth should probably said, well, we just went through labor and we just bore this baby and we went to name the baby John. <laughs> kind of ironically huh? or sarcastically. And the statistician said, also said that women have a hard time speaking with authority. For example, women should say, please, please complete this project by 3 p.m. But instead, women will say, women in leadership will tend to say, do you think that you could get this done by 3? Hmm. So maybe Elizabeth should have said, well, do you think that we could name my baby John? <laughs> In this same article, they said that women tend to use the word just a lot. For example, they would say, I just wonder if we could meet about this presentation. Or I just think that we could do a better presentation. So maybe Elizabeth should have said, well, 
I just think that we should name the baby John. <laughs> and I thought this is very interesting because this happens to me every day. The statistician who did the research said that people, men tend to interrupt women when they're speaking more frequently than they interrupt other men. And that is a fact, you can't deny that. In fact, they tend to interrupt women three times more than they interrupt men. Three times more often. Ho oh, ho, shame on them. And we also famous, know famously that women leaders tend to be called bossy, controlling, and a not very nice word, right? However, Elizabeth did bear John the Baptist so that we could repent, that we could change our old ways, and then we would, our hearts would be ready for Jesus. So what's the lesson out of this? What was it that Luke was trying to tell us through this story? What was he trying to tell us about people not listening to Elizabeth? What's the point? Well, I think this narrative tells us, number one, that we need to be silent. We need to learn how to be quiet and take in what people are saying to attend to all voices and see what it is that people throughout the world are trying to teach it. Secondly, we need to expect people. Just as, as uh, Zechariah was quiet for nine months, we need to learn how to be quiet and listen when people are talking. Because maybe this person has a message that will amaze you. So we need to learn to be silent. We need to learn to attend to people that we tend to discount. Women, children, refugees, people with disabilities, people from different cultures, people from different religious traditions. We should not silence them. We should not discount them. You know, you and I have disabilities. We're deemed disabled because we're deaf, right? And maybe some hearing people want to discount us and say, oh, we don't have anything important to say. Maybe you've got cerebral palsy. Maybe you have deaf blindness. There are a host of different disabilities you can have. And if you try to speak, and people may look at you outwardly, just as they looked at Elizabeth and Mary, Elizabeth, an elderly lady, and Mary, a teenage virgin, and just discount what they had to say. Their whole attitude to them was, what do you guys have to tell us? Get out of here. They didn't think they had anything important to say. Everybody thought Elizabeth and Mary were just housewives, but they were major players in God coming to the world. And that would not have happened without the two of them. And when Jesus resurrected, he appeared to the women first. So from conception on, we have lessons to learn. And one of those big lessons is to be silent, to read all of God's story, and to see worldwide where God has been acting. And also, we need to learn to listen 
from people that you would least expect to listen to and learn from. That could be young people. That could be elderly people. It could be people that have been marginalized. It can be those who are imprisoned. It could be people who experience oppression. God may be trying to touch people through you and through me. And that is amazing. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's go ahead and sing with Lori. So hold on just a minute and I'll highlight her. <laughs> 